We're thankful for this book, this truth, this amazing word that you have given to us. And it is uh, a source of encouragement and hope. And so we ask again that your spirit will teach us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, in 1988, John Malloy wrote a book. Some of you are going to remember as soon as I say it, it was called Dress for Success. I think its uh, principles are still around in, in a variety of forms, but uh, Mr. Malloy was putting forward the idea that the way you dress has a significant impact on a lot of different life experiences. Uh, for instance, whether you get the job or not may be somewhat dependent on how you present yourself in, in that dress. Uh, well, not in that dress, uh, that would not work for everybody, but as you dress, uh, how, how you do at work, the success or failure that you might have uh, in making a sale or not making a sale, and how you relate to people socially, relationally. So all of those things he put forward in that book with regard to how it is that uh, we present ourselves uh, by way of our dress. He even suggested that... Uh, People will listen to you or not listen to you based on your dress. So I felt like, in the interest of full disclosure, that I should tell you that I reread chapter 3. And chapter 3 is entitled, How to Maximize the Power of the Shirt. And uh, this particular shirt is simply going to compel you to listen this morning. <laughs> if, if, if you came and you really did not intend to listen, I'm sorry, you just are not going to have a choice this morning. You're going to have to listen. Uh, I did not go into the fourth chapter, which was the power of the tie. I, I, I thought that would be manipulative, and uh, I didn't want to wear a tie. So we're going to go with the power of the shirt. But listen, we know, don't we? We recognize that the way we present ourselves and the way we dress in those kinds of contexts uh, is important. Well, if it's important there... The scriptures talk about how we dress spiritually, and that, of course, is of far greater importance. Colossians chapter 3 is where we are. We are in a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to a church in the Valley of Lycus called Colossae, and we are in the third chapter as we just work our way through, verse by verse, this amazing book, and let's pick up at verse 12 this morning and read 12, 13, and 14. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. So you also must forgive. And above all these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony." In these verses, I want us to see this morning that the truth that God has revealed is the truth in which we are to live. The truth that God reveals to us is the truth that we're to live in. And the reality of, of what he says to us here is that we need to take off the old and put on the new and make sure that we are dressing in accordance with who we are, with our identity. So let's look, first of all, at what God says about us. This is very important. We've seen this principle before, and it's always good to know, isn't it, the context. So let's start there. What God says about us and the context in which he says that is both important and it's instructive, and to me it's particularly encouraging as you look at the beginning of verse 12. Because verse 12 starts off, put on then. I think we could probably translate that word then just as easily, therefore. The New American Standard uh, translates that uh, as and so. So in effect, what he's saying is as you begin verse 12, he says, now let's not forget what we just talked about, which was verses 1 through 11. Since this is a flow of thought that Paul is introducing in this third chapter, there is this strong call to ethical responsibility, to moral responsibility. The truth that God has revealed is the truth in which we are to live. God's not just giving us suggestions. He's not just giving us helpful hints. He's giving us truth that we are to live in, and that, that I think, is how this 12th verse is to be understood. Go back to verses 1 through 4. 
You've died with Christ. You've been raised with Christ. You're hidden with Christ. You're going to return with Christ in glory. So that was all about who we are. That was all about our position. And it's like Paul is saying to us, again, as we begin verse 12, do you know who you are? And I can envision Paul speaking in a setting in which he's going over these truths and getting pretty passionate right at this point about who it is that you are. Do you know who you are? That's the whole point of how he begins this 12th verse. He is wanting to establish again this sense of our position in Christ. Now, I suppose some people might argue that when you're trying to motivate somebody, maybe you don't start by telling them all of their privileges, and maybe you don't start by telling them all of their blessings. Maybe what you need to do is bonk them on the head and threaten them and tell them this is what's going to happen if you don't. Maybe there is a place for that. Paul doesn't do that, certainly here. He goes back and he says, you know what? Here is an absolutely amazing description again of who you are. So notice, secondly, this amazing description, it's nothing less than the blessings of God's grace in our life. Verse 12, put on then, therefore, look back and see what I've just said. In light of that, put on then as God's chosen ones, as God's holy ones, we could say, and as God's beloved ones. So here we have this threefold description of the grace of God. It's Titus 2.12. For, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts, and telling us that we should live soberly and righteously in this present age. That is exactly the same thing he's saying here. Do you know who you are? Well, then live in light of who you are, because the grace of God has appeared, and it has brought salvation to you. And there are three things that he says in particular, threefold description of who you are. And the first one, we are chosen. We are the chosen ones. Eklektoi is the word. Eklektoi. What do you suppose eklektoi? It means elect. You are the elect ones. You are the picked ones. You are the chosen ones. You are the selected ones. Now, we're not going to get into the doctrine of election this morning. Some people are always uncomfortable with that doctrine and that truth. This isn't the point at which we're going to delve into the mysteries of that doctrine, but God's not the least bit reticent to say to us, you're the chosen ones. You're the select ones. You're the ones that I have called out of this world. It's from Genesis to Revelation. So whatever you may believe about that truth, it fills the pages of Scripture. And so here's two things I want you just to take away from this idea of the fact that we are chosen ones. Whatever else it means, it means that God has been and is at work in your life. Whatever else this doctrine means, however you have come to understand it, and I hopefully it is in a biblical context that you have come to understand what it means to be chosen by God, but it is certainly a picture of God's sovereign grace in eternity past doing a work on our behalf. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ Jesus with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Now, you get, the same words appear in, first, uh, uh, in Ephesians 1, 4 to 6 as he shares here. We're chosen. We're the chosen ones. Second thing I want you to see is this idea that election is not some theoretical, doctrinal, up in an ivory tower discussion for theologians. It has practical, ethical, moral implications for how we live. That's why Paul begins as he does. It's a practical truth that is to impact our life. It says to us, God is a seeking God. And you know why God is a seeking God? Because you and I are runners. (laughs) We're running away from God. There is none that seeks after God. No, not one, Paul says in Romans. 
So God seeks us and he calls us to himself. So we're chosen, first of all, great blessing. Secondly, we are holy, we're holy. This is a room filled with saints. We don't have to go out and do a whole list of things. We don't have to have somebody confer some title upon us. It is what God says about us as those who have put their faith and trust in Christ. We are called holy, which is the word for saints. It's the way Paul started off in Colossians chapter 1, verse 2. To the saints, to the holy ones, to those who are set apart. Now, again, this, he's drawn us to the context, right? And as he draws us into this context, what has he just done in verses 5 through 11? In verses 5 through 11, he's just listed out one behavior after another which is not very attractive. And we were chagrined to learn that he's talking about all of us. He's talking about Christians who are in process. And so in that context, he says, but you know what, folks? These things may be true in your life at various times, but you're saints. You're the called out ones. So we're to live distinctive and different lives from the world. Thirdly, he says, we're beloved, we're beloved. Very, very similar to the language of Ephesians 1, as we just read. We're the objects of his love, and what is in view whenever we see this kind of language is the, the doctrine of adoption, which is one of the most amazing doctrines in all of the New Testament. And it is God saying to us, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse three. So there you have it, my friends, you are chosen, you are holy, and you are beloved. What else do you need to know, right? What else do you need to know? When he says to us here, this is how it is that God sees you. He sees you as having been chosen, as being holy, and as being beloved. So we begin with God, we begin with what he says about us, and we understand on the basis of our faith and trust in Christ that we do not gain heaven by virtuous acts on our part. We have access to heaven because of the virtuous act of God towards us. And so if you're here this morning and you think it's possible to work your way to heaven and you're doing everything you can to be as good as you can because, boy, you hope someday when you stand before God, the scale's somehow going to tip in your favor. God says you've got it all wrong. The scale will never tip in your favor because what God demands of us is what he gives to us, and that is his very own righteousness. And we can't possibly achieve that on our own. So it is not by virtuous acts that we gain heaven, it is by the very virtuous act of God on our behalf that we have that. So what do we do with that? What do you do with the fact that you are specifically said to be chosen by God? What do you do with the fact that you are called by God to be a saint? You're holy. And he says, I think of you and I think of beloved ones in my family whom I've adopted. So that's what he does for the rest of these verses in 12 through 14. What God requires of us. What is it that God requires of us? And what he requires of, of us as we see in these verses is first of all that we put off the old self. We talked about that last week. We put off the old clothes, okay? That's verses five through 11. Verses five through 11 is all this old clothes that we're supposed to put off. And what does that clothing look like? Well, it looks like sexual impurity. It looks like sexual immorality. It looks like uh, thinking things that are impure. It is all of these things that Paul describes in verses five, six, and seven, these evil desires and passions that the world says just release and let go and just do whatever feels good. And Paul says, no, we, we are to take that off. Secondly, we're to take off emotions that are out of control. So anger and wrath and malice and slander and lying Get that out of there. Take that off. That's not supposed to be a part of your life. Why not? Because you're chosen, you're holy, and you're beloved. Get that stuff out of your life. Lay it aside. And then thirdly, speech. Speech that is hurtful and harmful. 
slander and obscene talk, and all of those things that make someone look so unattractive were to take that off. Now what you have oftentimes in Paul's letter is he will use the metaphor of clothing. And the metaphor of clothing is simply you, you take off that old clothes and you put on the new clothes. The old clothes is what I've just listed out, verses 5 through 11. Get it out of your life. You don't even need to go to your closet because it's not there anymore. You have no desire to, to, to wear that stuff any longer because you're chosen, you're holy, you're beloved. You've got a whole new wardrobe over here that you need to put on. You don't take and put on the new clothes over the old clothes. You take that old stuff off and put on the new. I've mentioned before that my last year in college and in between college and graduate school, I worked at a warehouse. It was actually a cold storage facility where we froze food and meat and, and various things that were sent to us as a storage facility. Well, one part of the plant was all the good stuff, the good food that everybody would have enjoyed being able to take part in. And, the, and another part of the plant was meat byproducts. Meat byproducts are used for basically dog food in this case, because we had a dog food manufacturing as a part of that warehouse. So depending on what area you got assigned to on any given day, it had a pretty significant impact on your life. <laughs> There was a big difference between handling bone-in ham and steaks and all of that stuff and going over to the other side and working the meat byproduct. Because we'd get these big semi-trailers in of 40 vats of tripe and lungs and every other imaginable byproduct that would come from an animal that's not edible for humans. And I tell you what, in the dead of summer in Omaha, and you worked on that side of the plant, everybody knew where you were working. And I would remember going home, and uh, our, uh, the home I grew up in, all the homes in Omaha have basements. And so that particular home I grew up in was like a three-story with a basement. And, it, and all of them have side doors. So that you'd go in the side door, and you'd be on the landing, and you could either go down to the basement or you could go up to the main floor. And I'd come home after work, I'd go down to the basement. That was where I was told, you go there always first. And so I'd go down there to take all that old clothes off. And invariably, my mom or somebody would yell and say, who is it? And you know, we just open the door and go in. And if they didn't hear me say, it's Carlin, all they would need to do is they would literally go over and open the door. They would say, who it? Oh, it's Carlin. They would literally just smell who came in the side door. That's the imagery that Paul has given to us here. Your, your life is very unattractive as a child of God if it's filled with sexual immorality in all of these ways that Paul has described. If it's emotions that are out of control. If it's speech that is harmful and hurtful to others. Very unattractive. Take it off, he says. You don't want it on. And then put on these other things. So let's look. What are we supposed to do? What are we supposed to put on? We're supposed to put on a new set of clothes. Put on a new set of clothes. Very quickly, three things about this new set of clothing. It will be plain, plain for all to see. It's going to be plain for all to see. I mean, how could it not be, right? How could it not be plain for all to see? When you put on compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, are you kidding me? That's as noticeable as anything could be. That's incredibly attractive. That's a pleasing aroma, isn't it? You encounter somebody who's compassionate, kind, humble, meek, and patient. You know it. Secondly, it's the opposite of everything else we just looked at. It's the opposite of everything else on those previous lists. In fact, it's kind of interesting. In verse 5, you have five sins. In verse 8, you have five sins. And in verse 12, you have five virtues. So it is totally a contrast. It couldn't be stronger. Take this stuff off. Stop this kind of behavior. Lay this aside. Get rid of this clothing that is so unattractive, and pursue these things. Put these things on. Clean out your closet and put in the new stuff. And you know what happens when you do thirdly? You're going to look a lot like Jesus. You're going to look a lot like Jesus. 
This is the example of Christ. This is the likeness of, of Christ. This is the character of God. That's all he's saying to us here. Listen to what he says in Romans 13, 14. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the language of clothing. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Galatians 3, 27. You have put on the Lord Jesus Christ. The metaphor of, of, of clothing. The language of putting on clothing. Galatians 5. What is the fruit of the Spirit? The fruit of the Spirit is the life of Christ. The fruit of the Spirit is the character of Christ. To walk in the Spirit and to have the Holy Spirit producing in your life the fruit of the Spirit is to have the Holy Spirit of God producing in your life the likeness of Christ. That's all he's saying to us here. It's going to be very noticeable. It's going to be a total contrast to what we just looked at previous. And you're going to look just like Jesus. So here's the wardrobe, all right? Five things. We're not going to be able to spend a lot of time on each of these five, but let's just look at them briefly. And I'm just going to draw out of Jesus' life what this looks like to me. So we have five pieces of clothing, clothing, and it starts with compassionate. Be compassionate. Be soft-hearted, if you will. Have a deep sense of mercy, a, a caring spirit. And if you see anything in the life of our Lord, you certainly see that, don't you? He had a compassion as he looked at people and he said his heart was filled with compassion because he saw them as sheep that had no shepherd, just wandering aimlessly through life. I love the, the picture that, that Matthew and Luke paint of Jesus looking down at Jerusalem and, and, and weeping, literally crying and saying, you know, oh, oh, Jerusalem, I would have gathered you together with me as a hen gathers her chicks but you would not. And it says he was filled with compassion. Think of the prodigal son and the story of that father. And you know what it says in Luke 15? That the father every day went out and then when he saw his son coming from afar, his heart was filled with compassion. That's what we're supposed to be. People who are compassionate, who know how to help, how to help in a way that doesn't hurt, but that in fact helps. We're to be kind, secondly, kindness, goodness of heart, displaying the grace of God. Ephesians 5, be kind one to another, right? So be kind to each other. Jesus' encounter with the woman at the well. Man, what a, what a demonstration of kindness to this lady who had probably very few people in her life and in her world ever show her the kindness that came anywhere near what Jesus did. And in fact, it's such a significant statement that, that John makes in John 4 when it says that Jesus had to go through Samaria. He didn't have to go through Samaria except for his compassion and kindness of heart because he wanted to have an encounter with this lady at the well. The story of the Good Samaritan, the generosity of this man who comes along and ministers to somebody that's not in his circle at all, that's outside of anybody that he should have cared for in that culture. And yet the kindness that he showed, the generosity of heart was so very evident. When we're kind, we put away harshness. When we're kind to each other, we're not abrupt with each other. When we're kind, we're in fact putting on a spirit of compassion and a spirit of generosity. Romans 12, 10, see if you can't outdo one another in this regard. And then thirdly, there's humility. So if those first two really kind of speak to how we relate to each other, this third one kind of looks right within us, doesn't it? This idea of humility, not so much thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less, as someone has said. It's having the right estimation of who you are. That's all. You just have a proper understanding of who you are. Jesus said in Matthew 11, in that call to come to him, come to him, why? Because he is humble of heart, Jesus said of himself. How could we ever forget our study in the upper room discourse in John 14? Jesus coming that night, taking the towel of a servant, wrapping it around his waist, and going man by man around that room and washing the dirty, smelly feet of those 12 men, one of whom was about to betray him. No greater picture of humility in the life of our Lord. And then there is meekness. Meekness, sometimes uh, translated gentleness. 
uh, easily viewed as weakness. Meekness is easily viewed as weakness by so many. Teddy Roosevelt, in fact, said he hate. He said, I, I hate a meek man. I hate a meek man, he said. Bobby Knight said, the meek may inherit the earth, but they don't get any rebounds. Well, that just misunderstands the idea of meekness. It's not weak. It's not a wallflower. It's not people running over you. You can throw an elbow or two and still, no, you probably shouldn't do that, but it, it isn't being pushed over. It's strength that's under control. That's what meekness is. There's power there. There's strength. How could it be otherwise? Moses is said to be the meekest man by Jesus. Jesus was referenced as being a man who was meek. Galatians 6.1 says, when you see a brother or sister who's fallen into sin, those of you who are meek, those of you who have a gentle spirit, you are the ones who are to go and help begin that restoration. 1 Peter chapter 3.15 the, the reason that we have a hope within us. How do we, how do we engage people, Peter said? When you're in, when you're in a, an argument, if you will, hopefully instigated by somebody else, but when you're in a discussion about something that you feel passionate about, the gospel, the truth of Scripture, what a great reminder from Peter when he says, you know what? You, you need to dial it back and speak with gentleness. Speak with the spirit of meekness. That's what really is going to count in that time, isn't it? And then the last one is patience, long-suffering, not short-tempered. And, and when, if, you're, if you're looking for patience in the life of our Lord, there's only one word that you can put into space, and that is disciples. <laughs> the patience of Jesus with the disciples is profoundly significant, isn't it? The absolute trust in God, that's what patience is. Patience is just simply trusting God for his timing, for his purpose, for his work to be done. So here we have a wardrobe, okay? We have five things that we're supposed to put on. So you go over to your closet, and in the closet there are these five attractive, beautiful pieces of clothing because we've already emptied out this other side of all this other stuff. And then look what Paul does in verses 13 and 14. In verses 13 and 14, he says, now here are three things that are going to keep this going. Here are three things that as you work these in to this wardrobe are going to be just amazing. Verses 13 and 14, let's just look at that again. Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so also you must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. We have three participles. We have three participles in the present tense, which is simply to say, here are things that we don't do one time and then lay it aside and we don't worry about it again. Here are three things that the Spirit of God says just continuously are to be a part of your life. What are they? First of all, bearing with one another. Bearing with one another. Why do you suppose Paul begins this triad of three by saying what we really need to be doing is we need to be bearing with one another? You know why? Because we all tend to be unbearable at times, right? In fact, I, I hope you won't think this of kind of me. I hope you won't judge me harshly. But I have taken the opportunity to put on the screen the name of everybody at Covenant who is unbearable. <laughs> and that's pretty much the whole group right there. And if we don't know who you are, then all the more reason to get your name in our directory so we can list you with us as being unbearable. Because that's the whole point of this, isn't it? Why do we need to bear with each other? Because all of us at times tend to be unbearable. Some of you tend to be more unbearable than others. Some of you are more unbearable at more times than others. Some of you are just barely unbearable, but everybody at some point is unbearable. And so isn't it instructive that he starts off, and you know there are like 28 different one another commands in the New Testament. Like 28 different forms of, of doing this with each other. That, that's why you have to be in community. That's why the Christian life was never meant to be lived all by yourself. That's why you can't just run in and out of here at 9.30 and go back home for a week. Because you are disobedient 
to the 28 commands of Scripture that said to do these things, you got to be in community with each other. So the first one is bear with each other. Bear with each other when someone is acting out of ignorance, when they're acting out of foolishness, when they're acting out of unkindness. Be one who bears with the other. Somebody says something unkind, bear with them. Somebody mistreats you, bear with them. Somebody cuts you off in traffic, uh, <laughs> bear down on them. No, no, bear, 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 bear with them. Uh, uh, pardon me, pardon me. Bear with them, yes, even in that instance. How do you do that? H- how can you possibly bear with somebody that does those kinds of things? Compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, patience. You've already got it on. You've got that clothing on, and then you bear. Secondly, you forgive each other, forgiving one another. So you endure, you bear with, and then oftentimes in that circumstance, you have to forgive, don't you? Neil Anderson said in one of his books, Most of the ground that Satan gains in the lives of Christians is due to unforgiveness. Most of the ground that Satan gains in the lives of Christians is due to unforgiveness. You know what that ground looks like? Bitterness, resentment, anger, wrath, malice, slander, yeah, all the things that he just talked about. The word forgive is the word charizomai, which is the verb form of the noun charis, which is grace. The word charis is grace. The word forgiveness is based on grace, isn't it? Look what he says. Forgive each other, how? As the Lord has forgiven you. One tiny little word, A-S, Because of the same way. How, how, did, how has God forgiven you? He has forgiven you gladly, generously, freely, often. So how do you forgive each other? Gladly, generous, freely, often. When I won't forgive, I'm in effect exaggerating your sin towards me and I'm minimizing my sin toward God. Because he said, as God has forgiven. When I understand the the, the gravity of my sin towards God, then your sin towards me seems relatively minor compared to my offense against God. But when we get those confused, we don't want to forgive each other. C.S. Lewis said everyone is for forgiveness. It's a wonderful idea until you have to do it. Until you have to forgive somebody, then it's not so much of a good idea. And then lastly, look, he says, loving one another. Verse 14, look at that verse again. And above all these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. It's an amazing way to wrap up these, this, this set of verses. Above all these things. What does he mean, above all these things? Well, he could simply mean like a capstone, right? Right? It could be like love is the hat (laughs) that you put on your head after you've put on all this other clothing, that love is the capstone, that that it's above all these things. could be that. It could also be that he's saying love is above all these things, right? That it is supreme, that it is the greatest virtue. So which of those is it? I think it's both. I don't want to pick one or the other. I think it's both. He's saying love is the capstone of all of these virtues. And it's also the central and supreme one. 1 Corinthians 13, if you've got everything else in order, remember, but you don't have love, then you're nothing. Like a clanging symbol and all of the rest of it. What is the outcome of this? This is a beautiful picture, my friends, because the outcome of behaving and acting towards each other in this way Do you see what it is? He says the outcome is harmony and unity. Now who doesn't want that? Harmony and unity. Because love holds it all together. 
the truth that God has revealed is not stuff we traffic in from 9.30 to 10.45 or 11 or 12 on Sunday morning. The truth that God has revealed is the truth that we're to live. It's the truth that we're to walk in. It's the truth that we're to be wearing because of who we are, chosen, holy, beloved. There's supposed to be something about you and me that is so distinctive and different that you can't possibly be overlooked. Now, if you're living the way everybody else does, then you just fit in with everybody else. But we're to dress to our identity. So what do we take away? Let's wrap up this metaphor with this. When you look in the mirror, what, you are, uh, what, what are you likely to see? All right, so we're, we're talking about clothing and we're talking about what we're putting on, taking off the old. So now as you're standing and you're looking in the mirror, what are you likely to see? Are you likely to see the old wardrobe, the stuff of verses 5 through 11? Or do you get to see the wardrobe of the righteousness of Christ? Does your clothing reflect who you are? Does it reflect your calling? What a difference verses 12 through 14 would make in our relationships. What, what a difference it would make if husbands and wives put off this old stuff and clothe themselves in this new wardrobe. What would your home be like if people were clothed in compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience? Bearing with one another, forgiving one another, loving one another. That's what Jesus has done for us, hasn't he? He's certainly born with us. He's certainly forgiven us. And he certainly loves us. So it's a wonderful opportunity to transition this morning to these elements on this table. To this time of worship in communion. And let me just say a, a word about that. At Covenant, we do this once a month. It is a celebration like no other because it physically brings us face to face with the reality of what Jesus did for us. This isn't a little thing we tack on at the end. This isn't something that we just feel compelled to do because, well, it's what a church is supposed to do. This is what God has commanded us to do. Do this as often as you think of me and, and, and remember what I have done and it takes us to the cross and it takes us to the grace of God and it takes us to the love of God and the forgiveness of God and it is an opportunity for you if you do not know Jesus in a personal way to think about what it is that God requires of you what it is he requires of me and that is what have you done with Jesus? What have you done with Christ? Does he have any place of significance in your life? Is he a word that you use when you wish you hadn't? Or is he the reason for your existence, your living, the passion, the heartbeat? Have you put your trust in Jesus alone for your salvation? That's the only condition to come to this table if you've put your trust in Christ we invite you to do that this morning if you're a believer in Christ as many of us are here this is also a wonderful opportunity to look in that mirror and to see what it is that we have on and it is a wonderful opportunity in which we just open our heart to God and say God you know what I've sure been wearing a lot of that stuff out of that old wardrobe and I don't I don't want to do that I want to put on these new garments and so maybe you just need a time of personal reflection and searching your own heart before God and seeking his forgiveness and grace to restore that fellowship 
that we have because of what Christ has done. So the worship team is gonna come. I'm gonna pray for us. We're gonna just listen and pray and think for the first part of the passing of the elements. The elements are gonna come to you again, stacked together. So take both the cup and the bread, they're stacked together. And then in just the quietness of your own personal worship, take the bread and the cup as you would want to. Let me pray for us and we will share in offering and in communion. Gracious Father, we're eternally grateful to be in your family. Lord God, we're we're in your family by your grace. We're in your family not because of anything that we've done. We're in your family because you are a seeking God and you have called us to yourself. Jesus paid the penalty for sin in his death on the cross. He was raised in power, overcoming sin and death. And Lord God, he is going to return one day. And you have said, observe these elements, this bread and this cup, in remembrance of what Jesus did, and do it until he comes again. So we remember and we look forward. And we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.